Hello and welcome to yet another tutorial by Davies Media Design. My name is Michael Davies and in today's tutorial I'll be going over what's new in GIMP 2.10.20. But of course, before I get into that, I wanna direct you guys over to my website at daviesmediadesign.com. As always, I have tons of free software tutorials on here, my GIMP book of layers, and free software help articles, so definitely check that out. You can enroll in my GIMP 2.10 Masterclass from Beginner to Pro Photo Editing on Udemy. You can enroll in any of my Skillshare classes by visiting gimschool.com. And you can get more with a premium membership to Davies Media Design. I'll include all the relevant links from this tutorial in the description of the video. GIMP 2.10.20 is finally here. It took about three and a half months to get this latest release version out, but who's counting? And in this version, there are some cool features introduced. I first wanna say though, I was expecting there to be the ability to select multiple layers in this release version. That did not happen, so that's going to have to wait for the next release version, I guess. But there are still tons of really cool features introduced in this latest version. For starters, the GIMP team has tweaked the new grouped tools feature in the toolbox. So now when you hover your mouse over the group tools, it's going to display the tools found in that group. So for example, here I have my toolbox on the left side. When I hover my mouse over it, you'll see that will automatically display what's inside these tool groups instead of me having to click and hold my mouse. Now this is going to be the default setting whenever you have the toolbox set up here in a single column, which is how I have my toolbox set up. So if this were not a single column, which it's hard to get out of with that new feature, but now you'll see when I hover my mouse over this, it will not show what's inside the tool groups. Although if I hover my mouse here long enough, there will be a little toolbox tool tip that pops up and that's going to tell you the tools inside the tool group as well as the shortcut keys found with that particular tool. And then you have to click and hold your mouse and those tools will then pop up. So I'm going to reset this back to the single column layout. You can turn this off if you wanna have the single column layout without this hover feature. And you can do that by going to edit, preferences, come over here to toolbox, and here you'll see the use tool groups option, which you can check or uncheck. And then menu mode here, I guess is what it's gonna be technically called. So here it says show on hover in single column. You can change these, so show on click or show on hover are the other two options. Show on click is the default behavior that came with 2.10.18. So you have to click and hold to see what's inside the tool group. And of course the show on hover in single column is the new setting. I'm gonna keep things the way they are, so I'll hit cancel. I think this will take some getting used to, but I do like the idea that you don't have to click and hold because there are some times where I forget what tool is inside each tool group. So this will just help me quickly look through each tool. The next new feature is one that's going to add to GIMP's non-destructive arsenal, and that is going to be the non-destructive cropping feature. So if I hit shift C on my keyboard to grab my crop tool and let me hold control and zoom out. So right now I have this set to fixed 16 by nine aspect ratio and I have allow growing turned off. So let's say I crop my image here and I'll just center up my crop and I'll double click the same way I would any other crop. The main difference now is that this is going to crop the canvas as opposed to cropping the actual layer. So you'll see the layer that I'm on in this case, it's gonna be my image layer down here is still its full size and it's going off of the canvas boundary. So this just allows you to return back to the original image size if you want to at any point in time. That includes when you close down GIMP and then reopen GIMP in another session. So this is just a non-destructive editing feature now, whereas the old behavior would simply crop this layer down to the canvas size and that data would be lost. So if I hit the M key on my keyboard to grab the move tool, this means I can also move my image inside the crop. And I'll hit control Z to back up. Let's say I wanted to restore the crop back to the size of my original layer. So the size of the original image, I can do that just by going to image, fit canvas to layers, and now we have restored our canvas size to the size of our original image, effectively undoing the crop. I'll hit Shift C to bring up my crop tool again. If you want this to have the same old behavior, so when I drag my crop tool here, reposition it, 
If you want the crop tool to cut out that layer so that it permanently slices it basically. So back to that destructive behavior. And I promise I'm not trying to talk smack about the old cropping method. It is what it is. I'm just using the technical terms here. But all I'd have to do is come over here and choose delete cropped pixels. And now when I crop this, that is going to crop the layer to the canvas size. The only problem, of course, is if we save this and exit, we're not gonna be able to undo that crop and therefore restore this back to its original size. So I'll hit Control Z to undo that and uncheck this option. So I really like that new crop tool feature. Also, one thing I almost forgot to mention, if I crop this using the non-destructive method, I can see the portion that was cropped out if I go to View, Show All. So that is going to show everything going on here, including what's going on outside of my canvas. And that allows me to better reposition this if I want to inside the crop area, which you can see is going to be this orange dotted line. So let's go to view, show all to turn that off. And let's back up. So control Z to undo that. The next new feature for GIMP 2.10.20 is going to be the new on-screen controls for the existing vignette filter. So I already have a vignette on this composition. I'm going to hide that layer and we'll come over here and create a new layer. And I've already got the layer name I wanna use for this. We'll fill it with transparency and click okay. So now I'll add a vignette by going to filters, light and shadow, vignette. So you'll see we have the same controls over here, the same tool settings, but now of course we have the on-screen controls for this. This is very similar to the on-screen controls used in Darktable, but there are some subtle differences, including the main difference being this little midpoint line. But in Darktable, the terms for the inner circle and outer circle are going to be the radius and the falloff circle. I'm not sure if GIMP uses that same terminology, but essentially the radius circle or the inner circle is going to control the point at which the vignette stops. The midpoint is going to be the midpoint of the actual falling off of the vignette, so the fading out of the vignette. And the fall off circle is going to be the point at which the vignette reaches full strength. And so from this point on, the vignette is going to be usually totally opaque if you have this set to 100% opacity. As you can see, everything outside this outer circle is going to be black in this case because we have our color set to black. So you can click and drag this and you can see what happens here. When I drag this outer circle, it's taking the midpoint with it and it's just stretching out that vignette. It's essentially increasing the radius slider here. And you can see it's also adjusting the softness. If I only adjust the midpoint, you'll see what happens. The gamma will be adjusted. And if I adjust the inner circle here, that will also adjust the softness and it's going to shift that midpoint out. You can also use these little handles to squish this, so that's going to adjust the squeeze. You could do this either horizontally or vertically. And you could do that using the outer circle handles as well. And if I hold the shift key and I drag one of these limits out, one of these circles out, it's going to drag both of them, so that's going to adjust the limit of both the inner and outer circle. Finally, if I hover my mouse outside of all the circles, you'll see a little rotation icon pop up next to my mouse cursor. So we can actually rotate this just by dragging to the left or right. They've also added two new vignette shapes. So in addition to circle, square, and diamond, we also now have horizontal and vertical. So if I choose horizontal, you'll see that's going to flatten out the circles and just make them lines and I'll hold the shift key, drag this in. So that's just giving us a horizontal vignette. So the vignette's just going all the way across the top and bottom. And then on the other hand, when we do a vertical vignette, now it's going all the way across the left side and the right side in an upward direction. And we could still use the midpoint and that radius or the inner adjustment there. So that's the new vignette tool. I'm gonna hit cancel because I don't want to apply those changes to this and I'll unhide the existing vignette. Let's delete this vignette layer. So with this latest release version of GIMP, the GIMP team has introduced three new blur filters. They're all pretty advanced, and this is going to start with the variable blur filter. Let's demonstrate this filter by first putting all of my layers on a single layer. So I'll go to Layer, New from Visible, and so everything's on this visible layer. And now I need to add a new layer that's going to be similar to a layer mask. So I'm gonna come over here, create a new layer, and we'll rename this mask, fill it with transparency and click okay. 
If I hit the G key on my keyboard, that'll bring up my gradient tool. So what this filter does is it basically uses your mask layer to blur those areas that you designate. I'm pretty sure this is supposed to work like a layer mask where the white areas are going to be blurred and the black areas will not be blurred. So it's gonna be similar to the way transparency works with a traditional layer mask. So let's say I wanted to blur the area that had the bunny. Let's change the shape here to radial and we'll draw our gradient here. I do have my foreground and background color set to black and white. I'll come over here and swap the gradient colors and let's shift the midpoint of this. I'm gonna hit the enter key. So now we have a mask layer and we have our visible layer. So let's click on the visible layer and go to filters, blur, variable blur. So now we need to select our aux input. So this is similar to the bump map filter. I'm gonna click on this. Here we have our images that are opening GIMP. Right now I only have one composition open, so that's what's showing up there. And I'll come over to my mask layer. You can also use channels if you want to, but in this case I'm just going to use this mask layer. So I'll double click on that. So right now it looks like nothing's happening because this mask layer is obscuring our layer below. So if I come over here and I hide the mask layer, you'll see now that the area that was designated as white is blurring the bunny and we can turn the blur up or down using the radius slider here. And so what this is doing is it's adding a Gaussian blur to that area. This is gonna be kind of slow right now because I'm using a fairly large image, but you can see that in action. And if you want, you could set this to be a high quality blur. I'm not entirely sure what the linear mask option does just yet, but I'll come over here and click OK. All right, and after some time that has now applied that variable blur here to my layer. And let's come up here, let's unhide the mask. So the areas that were white have now been blurred using a Gaussian blur, and the areas that were black were not blurred. The areas of middle gray had a slight blur applied. So it's basically like applying a Gaussian blur with the layer mask to mask out areas that you don't want that blur being applied to. So I'm just going to delete these two layers. So now we're back to our original. So that brings us to the second new blur filter found in this latest release version of GIMP, which is going to be the lens blur. As its name suggests, this is designed to emulate the blur of a camera lens. So once again, I'll go to layer, new from visible, and go to filters, blur, lens blur. So this by default will blur the active layer you're on, or you can come over here and choose an aux input. And so the same thing applies here. You can turn the radius up or down to increase or decrease the amount of blur. The main difference being you also have a highlight factor slider, and this allows you to increase or decrease the amount of blur applied just to the highlights of your image. And that's going to help achieve that blur effect that would be achieved by a camera lens. So that makes that look more realistic. You can also clamp the highlights or the shadows of the highlight threshold to kind of control how much of your highlights are being blurred. And you can see that you can manually input the values you wanna use there. I'm gonna reset that. So there you can see what that filter is doing. I'll hit cancel. The third and final new blur filter is going to be the focus blur. And this one I'm really excited about. It allows you to create that popular tilt shift effect without using a third party plugin. The tilt shift effect just to review is the effect you use when you want to create that miniature effect. So you are effectively shifting the focus plane of an image and that makes everything in your image look miniature. This also allows you to create a realistic depth of field effect. So whenever you want to do something like blur the background, but you want the blur to look like something that came straight out of your camera and not something you did as a post-processing technique. So let's demonstrate this. We'll go to filters, blur, focus blur. And you'll notice here that this focus blur effect has the same on canvas controls as the vignette filter. So we can drag this outer circle outward and it also has a midpoint here, except instead of it being a vignette, it's going to be an amount of blur. And this inner circle is going to determine at which point the blur is going to stop. So everything outside this inner circle will not have blur. And we can adjust the midpoint here. So the cool thing about this filter is not only can you change the shape, but you can also change the blur type. So by default, this is set to Gaussian blur, 
but you can also use the new lens blur filter as the blurring method and that shows up the settings for that new filter. So you can adjust the highlight factor here. I'm just gonna set this to Gaussian blur for now. And you'll also see you have this high quality setting so this allows your blur to have a higher quality. But if you wanted to create that tilt shift effect, you can come over here, grab a handle, and just squeeze this in. And then grab this other handle and drag this outwards. And the tilt shift effect isn't really gonna work with this image just based on the subject matter, but you guys get the point. And I can come over here, turn up the blur radius to turn up the amount of blur. So there you can see this blur filter in action. And before I apply this or cancel out of here, I do want to point out that another new feature in GIMP 2.10.20 is the blending options feature. So pretty much all of the Gaggle filters now have this option. And when you expand it, it allows you to change the layer mode of the filter you're working on. So right now this mode is set to replace, but I can come over here and choose from any of the layer modes found in GIMP or the blending modes found in GIMP. And I can come over here and I can change this back to the default option if I want. I can also adjust the opacity of the effect directly from the effect dialog here. So instead of working on the opacity after the fact, which sometimes you can't do if you're working directly on the layer, you can adjust the opacity from inside the effects controls here. And that just gives you a bit more control over the filter. You'll also see that you can turn the on canvas controls on or off. So if you wanted to hide those, you can go ahead and hide those. And as per usual, you have the split view option here because this is a Gaggle filter. So that allows you to see a before and after of this effect. So I'll click OK to apply those changes. The next new feature in GIM 2.10.20 is the new Bloom filter. So this filter is going to be similar to the old Soft Glow filter, which just adds a glow to your image. Except the Soft Glow filter desaturated your highlights when you added that glow. So this filter is not going to desaturate your highlights and therefore it's going to do a better job of preserving your original image. But essentially what this plugin does is it takes the highlights from your image, feathers them, and then adds them back to the image giving it that sort of soft glow look. They've called it the Bloom filter. So let's see this filter in action and I just want to note I scaled this image down a second ago. I'll go to Filters. Light and Shadow, Bloom. So here you can see what's happening with this Bloom filter. The threshold is going to allow me to control the areas of brightness. So if I turn the threshold down, that will increase the amount of glow or brightness happening on here. If I turn it up, it'll decrease it. So we can adjust the softness here. And you can see increasing the softness kind of disperses the glow throughout the entire image a bit more. Whereas if I decrease it, it sort of concentrates the glow. The radius controls the actual glow area. So if I increase the radius here, you can see the glow is spreading out. Or if I decrease it, it's going to bring it back in more. And we can adjust the strength of the actual glow. So turning that up is going to make it glow even more. Turning it down will make it glow less. And then we have a limit exposure option. So don't overexpose highlights. That'll keep our exposure in check there. And of course we have the new blending options here, which I'm going to collapse those. And the clipping option for when the glow goes outside your original boundaries. So I'll click OK to apply those changes. You can see here's a before, here's an after. The next new feature I wanna highlight is that GIMP has improved the rendering performance of its filters. So let me demonstrate inside of here and I'll go to filters. We'll go back to blur, focus blur. And let's turn on the on canvas controls. So usually when you are adjusting your filters, as I am adjusting the settings here, hold control, use my mouse wheel to zoom out. So usually when you're working with your filter and then you come over here and you turn the preview off and then turn it back on, the Gaggle filter has to re-render each time the settings that you've created here using your filter. So the difference now is that, let's say I made some more adjustments and then I turn the preview off and on again. You'll see that the preview is now going to render much more quickly because GIMP is now storing the previous versions of this filter in a temporary cache. 
and it can then pull those settings from the cache so that it can more quickly display the filter. So basically all you need to know about this is it's going to allow GIMP to more quickly display the filter previews instead of having to re-render the preview each time you turn the preview off and then on again. So you're not gonna get that choppy preview rendering now whenever you are wanting to preview the effects of your filter. So I'll hit cancel. So GIMP now supports exporting high bit depth Photoshop documents up to 16 bits per channel. And the GIMP team says it's going to properly arrange the order of your color channels when you're exporting to a PSD. That way your colors will properly display when opened up into Photoshop. Additionally, painting tool presets have been upgraded to now be able to include blending modes as well as opacity. So when you're creating some presets for your paint tools, you can now include those features. GIMP now properly recognizes CR3 files and those are going to be Canon RAW files. I work with CR2 files, so CR3 files are like the next generation RAW files. So GIMP is now going to properly recognize these files and then when you double click on them to open them into GIMP, it's going to first open them up in the appropriate RAW processing software. So whatever software you have installed and designated on your computer, for example, something like Darktable. So then you can process your RAW CR3 file in Darktable before closing that down and then that will open up your file into GIMP. So as a lot of you know, GIMP runs on Babel and Gaggle, and there have been updates made to each of these. For Babel, most notably, there is now the integration of Vala plugins. So this is not something that I'm accustomed to because I'm not a plugin developer or really a developer in any capacity for that matter. But for some of you, that may be welcome news. Gaggle has also received some updates and that's going to include some new features found in some Gaggle filters, which includes some of the new filters I've mentioned earlier in this tutorial. However, there is also some new functionality to existing filters. For example, the drop shadow filter is now going to include the ability to add essentially a stroke around text or objects. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna hit the T key to grab my text tool. We'll click on here and type GIMP, Control A to select that text. Let's increase the size of the text and change the color here to white. And we'll go to filters light and shadow, drop shadow. So hold control, zoom in a bit. So we have the typical settings for the drop shadow here. And let's change the color of the drop shadow because it's kind of hard to see right now. So the new feature here is, let me change the X and Y values to zero and also decrease the blur radius size to zero. Now we have this feature here called grow shape and you'll see there's some various options here. But essentially what this is allowing us to do is to add a border or a stroke around our text or whatever object we have. And we can do that using this grow radius option. And we can also adjust the opacity here. So if I middle click on that and let's come over here at a one. So this is fully opaque. So here you can see what's happening when we turn the grow radius up, it's adding a stroke around our text. So this is just a cool new way to easily add a stroke to text and we can use our mouse wheel to cycle through the grow shape. So there's the diamond grow shape, and here is the square grow shape. So we'll stick with circle there and click OK. So there is a new improvement that comes with the Gaggle updates. And I'll end this tutorial with a bit of news. So the GIMP team says they are getting close to finishing up the 2.99 series. So this is going to be essentially the unstable development versions that will lead to the GIMP 3.0 version. These versions are very common to allow people to test out the versions before they do a full on release. So this doesn't mean necessarily that GIMP 3.0 is getting very close. What it means is that testing for GIMP 3.0 is on the horizon. And from there, the GIMP team can make improvements and they can launch GIMP 3.0. But that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you liked it. If you did, you could check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Davies Media Design. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified each time I have a brand new tutorial. You can also check out any of the links to my resources in the description of the video. But thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.